Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, I'm Bowen. Um, I've been a, like a master's of engineering student at, in the Media Lab, uh, specifically in camera culture. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you uh, in the first part about this paper that we published at ICLR uh, this year, um, uh, where we use uh, reinforcement learning to like design neural network architectures. And then after that, if there's time, I will be going into like this follow-up work that we did where we kind of like have designed like this practical early stopping model such that you, you know, can like get drastic speed ups in the architecture selection process. So let's jump into it. Um, so first, I uh, just want to thank my co-authors. Uh, Ramesh Raskar is the, the head of our lab. Uh, Nicole and Utkrist were uh, also some co two collaborators. And yeah, so uh, if you guys have like any background in neural networks, you've probably seen, you know, one of these three before. This is uh, VGG, ResNet, and Inception. Um, and these are all kind of models that have come about over the years through the ImageNet uh, classification challenge where you have like the, uh, you know, a large data set of about like a, a million images uh, or more and, you know, a thousand different types of classes of images. And these are really good at basically like classifying, you know, which images are, are, are what object. Um, and so for instance here, it's my cat Taro, and they would be like really good at recognizing, you know, is Taro a cat, dog, potato, or house, right? Well, okay, in, in this case, Taro's, Taro root is pretty close to potato, so they're smarter than we think, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, they may not be the best in every domain, and if you have any practical experience uh, in deep learning, you may have, you know, tried out one of these models uh, and applied <coughs> it to the problem that you want to solve, and you may have gotten okay results, you may have gotten really great results, but sometimes you don't get very good results. Uh, and so here's just kind of like a case study um, with this uh, MIT startup that I've been uh, helping out with. So they're called Perch. And basically they want to make an, uh, a workout tracking system where you put a depth camera up on top of a workout rack. So as you can see here, someone is squatting with like one of those big barbells over them. Uh, and so basically what they want to do is they want to be able to track where the bar is so you can real-time track reps, how fast the reps are, maybe even form, all those types of things. Um, and so very simply, the first image problem that they wanted to solve was take this depth image, throw it through a neural network, and then get out basically a label of where this bar was. So then they could track the bar in 3D space. Um, okay, so what's the problem? That seems pretty easy. Let's just throw inception at it. We're done, right? Well, the first problem is that Perch is trying to make a really cheap product, and they're using really mean, minimal hardware, and I really mean minimal. They want to use like about a hundred dollar GPU, and they want to run it at around 30 FPS, so real time, so they can do like you know track some of the faster movements. And I, let me tell you that Inception, VGG, and ResNet will not run at <laughs> 30 FPS on a $100 GPU. Um, so we have a problem, and basically the solution would be to hire someone like me to design the architecture for them. And you know, I've done like a pretty okay job at like throwing together something that works at that speed, but it's definitely not the best that anyone could design, especially not like a single person with like uh, not that much time. Uh, so what do we do? So the idea number one would just be to you know use some standard hyperparameter optimization package, um, like a Bayesian optimizer with a, a Gaussian process prior. Uh, it's a lot of words, but it's just kind of like one of the maybe like default hyperparameter optimize optimization techniques. Um, the problem though is that uh, convolutional neural nets can have a variable number of layers. So as you saw in that first picture with all the, those three different networks, they're all different sizes. Some of them kind of had like splits going on, some of them had skip connections, and all of these kind of like, if you want to choose an architecture, you have to be able to deal with a varying number of hyperparameters because you can have a varying number of layers. These default packages don't really work uh, with uh, that constraint that well, um, and so that's one, one reason you wouldn't go there. Uh, the next is that, uh, you know, these neural nets can have like hundreds, thousands of layers you know, Bayesian, optimi Bayesian optimization packages don't really work that well at that um, uh, degree of hyperparameters that you're trying to optimize. So idea number two, which we'll be talking about, is using reinforcement learning. So just super briefly, this is basically what reinforcement learning is. At any, you know, if anyone ever says anything like policy gradient, Q learning, it kind of all boils down to this, where you have an agent that is put into environment 
the agent is like will take an action and then basically it will receive an observation and a reward from the environment. It's pretty much that simple and the agent's goal is to optimize the like total expected reward it receives from the environment over however many time steps you let it act in that environment. And um, so we've basically seen um, like great success from this technique in many different domains, you know, controlling quadcopters, um, playing AlphaGo, if you guys were, or playing Go, uh, where, you know, DeepMind beat Lee Sido last year, um, playing the Atari game set, uh, playing backgammon, you know, back in like the like early 90s, I think. So it's had a lot of success in many different domains. This is all game playing, but it's also had success in, say, like, you know, kind of miniaturized, like, stock trading algorithms and those types of things. So it's not only games. Cool. Um, and so just kind of with that background, um, I now want to jump into uh, what, what we actually worked on, basically using reinforcement learning to solve this problem of architecture selection. Uh, and so we'll start off by showing basically uh, how we can model architecture selection as kind of this discrete decision process. So in that reinforcement learning loop where you have agent, action, observation, reward, right, you need to be able to discretize or like basically like make the architecture selection process a, um, uh, make the creation process a set of steps that the agent can go through, right? Uh, I'll give you a brief uh, background on Q-learning and kind of go through like one Q-learning update in our space so you guys are very clear about that, uh, then show you some results and then if we have time at the end, go through the, the kind of the next paper um, where we like uh, use early stopping to make it all, all faster. And so um, here, we can see this is a simple like kind of state action graph, okay? And so all of these circles um, represent states that the agent could be in. And so this would kind of be like the observation it gets from the environment. And the arrows are the actions it can take. And so the way we've formulated the problem is the agent will always start at the input layer, right? You have to feed your images into the network so you can learn it, right? Then it has the choice of, say, choosing a convolutional layer or choosing a pooling layer, right? Um, and then if it chooses a convolutional layer, it simply just goes to a state of being at a convolutional layer. So its state is only is the most recent layer it picked. Once it's at a convolutional layer, it can then, again, choose another convolutional layer. It can choose a pooling layer. Or it can go to a goal state, here defined as G, which you know, would basically be like terminate the network. That would represent, in like classification, that would be your softmax layer. Um, and then you would go about like evaluating uh, the network. And so, like I said, you know, you can and you can have many different types of choices. You could have whatever types of layers you'd want. But basically, what the agent is doing is it's going through this kind of environment, selecting layers until it decides to stop selecting layers. You put a softmax on the end of all these layers, and that's a neural network. And so, uh, we will see that here, um, where the agent has you know started the input state. It moved to a convolutional, it chose a convolutional layer, it chose a pooling layer, and then it said, I'm done, I'm going to go to the goal state. And then as we can see here, this is the simple neural network that it just designed. It's, a, it's a, the input, the images, like, you know, whatever, you see, far 10, image net, whatever. Uh, the convolutional layer, pooling layer, and then a softmax layer. And this is like a trainable neural network that you can then evaluate on whatever task you're, you're trying to, to do. Is everyone clear on, on kind of how we have like uh, organized the task for the agent? Yeah. Can you go back a little bit how we how we decide to choose the convolutional layer? Was from the example that you were supplying? Or? Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, so this is um, just like an example path the agent could have taken. We haven't talked about like how we'll actually go about <coughs> deciding which is the best option. Okay. Go back to the single slide. <coughs> oh, to the what? Go back a few slides where the, the single say on this one. Uh, does it require that the environment is constant? Um. So that when we when you talked about how uh, the agent learn from the environment get reinforcement in this particular problem space of the startup, does it require that everything else around? 
Are you talk were you talking for the um, like the specific case study I was showing? Yeah. Oh, um, I mean it shouldn't really rely like the whole, yeah you would really hope that um, like a depth image would generalize very broadly to like many different gyms and that type of thing. So like you would hope that like and we ran like in data set creation one thing you would do is like randomize the background a lot so that when you move into a new environment like it won't really like accidentally pick up on something like that. Yeah. Um, cool, and so now that we've kind of like uh, uh, had an example of how it would actually go through the space, I just want to briefly uh, go through uh, the Q learning algorithm, which was, this is how we actually have the agent learn um, which layers to choose are the best at any given point in its like network selection, selection process. And so for some uh, notation, uh, we call this uh, the Q value. And so the Q value, Q star means optimal, basically. If it's not optimal, there won't be a star. Uh, S is a state, and then U is the action that the agent has taken from that state. So Q star of SU means it's, this is the total expected reward the agent would receive starting at state S and then taking action U. And after that point, the total expected like summed reward it would, it would achieve. Um, and this is uh, Bellman's equation, which is basically like kind of defining how, uh, this, how this Q value is actually recursive, right? Because this Q value is the total expected re future reward. But you can actually define that in terms of the total expected future reward from the next step, right? Because that, uh, the Q value is actually just the reward you would receive from this state action pair from the environment plus like the max over, like, Q values of the next states. Is that, is that, a little bit, is that clear? What's the discount factor? All right, so the discount factor is, um, in some cases, it's just mathematically necessary. You keep it between zero and one, so that, you know, basically your Q learning algorithm is like a Lipschitz contraction. But intuitively, what it means is, um, say I am trying to have a train a stock trading agent, right? And so the agent gets to sell stocks, buy stocks, whatever, right? Um, and so this algorithm without, or this equation without the discount factor, it could basically learn that, you know, I should buy some stock now and then hold for like a billion years, right? Well, we don't really care about if we make money in a billion years. I'm dead, you're dead. Probably, maybe everyone's dead. I don't know, you know? So uh, the discount factor will basically discount future rewards and kind of like emphasize shorter term rewards in that way. Yeah. 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 Basically, uh, uh, that's what I don't understand. It implies that reward is additive along the path, right? So when you are like in the middle, how could you attribute the reward because you can't actually know before you are finished and that is a mistake? Yeah. Um, are you talking about in specifically for neural networks? Or no, I don't understand why it's additive, like in the equation, when you sum along the path, and why you only get reward in the path. Um, so, depending on the... Put it to the current action and the new path. Oh, um, yeah, so basically, like, in this, this equation is really hard to analytically solve. Um, and so basically what you do is, uh, which we'll see with the Q-learning algorithm. So this equation is, like, only in some, like, basically non, I guess maybe some, like based on some very really simple discrete cases, can you just like solve everything? You really can't ever. Um, and so what we actually do is we kind of do this iterative update where um, what we actually say is like when we're, we want to like update, um, so now as you can see, we don't have Q star. So this is like an estimate of the optimal Q value, right? And so these t's down here are our like estimate of the q value at time t, at time t plus one. And so say you know we had the agent go out into the environment, it sampled the trajectory, it got a bunch of rewards, right? Now we want to say, okay, how do we actually learn from that trajectory? It just went out and uh, and explored. So what we do is the agent has all these internal q values, and we say, okay, we want to update. Uh, say we visited state s sub i, and we took action u in this sample trajectory the agent went through. Uh, I want to update it as kind of a, uh, as a sum, uh, a weighted sum of my old estimate plus the reward I received 
from that state action pair times like plus like the max over my estimates of the future states. If that makes sense. And so um, that's kind of how that attribution happens. So as you can see, the Q value at state um, S sub i will actually be influenced by the Q value at state S sub j, where like the agent has gone from S sub i to S sub j, right? And you're just saying like, oh, my estimate for the Q value here at S sub i is the weighted sum of its previous Q value plus the Q value at the next state. And so, as you, and so it'll be like updated along the chain that way. What's the typical value for alpha? I uh, used like 0 0.01. It's kind of. Uh, I think like I think for a uh, theoretical convergence, you have to anneal it, um, but uh, it's not really, like for like these problems. I mean, you know, theoretical convergence only happens at in infinity like samples anyway. So I just keep it at like 0 0.01 in my experiments. Yeah. Um, cool. So now just, that was a lot of math and kind of confusing. So I just want to go through, so here's like our state action graph again. Uh, pretty simple, right? We just have the input. We have like the different types of convolutional layers, pooling layers. And um, now I want to show you like just like a brief, like how we actually update these Q values. Because we want to learn how to select layers, right? Um, and so here, right, remember the Q values were the utility of a state action pair. And so every arrow here is actually a state action pair, where the state is the previous state and the action is kind of like the next state you have, right? And so I just have like initialized all of the Q values to 0 0.5. Then we chose the same network that we had before, you know, input to convolution, to pooling, to softmax. And um, say that I trained that network, right? So on my task, on CIFAR 10, and I got you know 90% accuracy, right? Um, now I want to basically update all my Q values based on this this information I've just received that this network achieved 90% accuracy. So again, here's my uh, Q value equation. I'm going to set this down to one just for simplicity, and alpha to 0 0.1 just for simpl simplicity. But basically, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, um, I'm going to start at the the, like the, the, the transition closest to the end, right? That's here at the bottom. And so you basically take 0 0.9, so 1 minus alpha, times the previous Q value, which was just the randomly it's 0 0.5, the initialized value, plus the learning rate 0 0.1 times the reward I received, which was 0 0.9, right? Because there's no uh, future state after the goal state, you don't add anything to that, right? There's no future Q value. You've ended the, the, the path. And so, okay, great. Now my new value is 0 0.54, and I go to updating the next one. So here, now it's again 1 minus alpha, 0 0.9 times my previous Q value, plus my learning rate alpha, 0 0.1, times the reward plus the max over future Q values. And <coughs> Here, we don't actually give the agent any reward because now we're kind of like at an internal transition in the network. And so there's no reward there, but there is like uh, the max over the future Q values. This term is now 0 0.54 because we just updated that value. And so, and so now our new Q value here is 0 0.504. Um, and so we can just kind of continue doing that all the way to the end. And so now, as you can see, like, we don't have any updated information about you know, these actions because we haven't explored any, any networks that have used those actions. But I do have information about the actions that I did take, like the input to the convolutional layer. And so if I were to just sample one network and then run my Q-learning algorithm and then say, OK, I want to like, use what I've learned, I would just take the greedy policy and like have my agent start here and then select you know, the max Q value, take that action, go to the next state, select the max Q value again, and you would basically just can reconstruct this network. In practice, we're going to sample a ton of networks, update all of the Q values like randomly, um, and then you'll kind of get a pretty good uh, actual like, utility estimates of which layers you should choose. And so, yeah, so basically we saw how the agent will sample network topologies, right, just by going through that state action graph. 
we saw how those actually manifest as you know, neural networks. Then once they've manifested, we can train the neural network on the task, so like some image classification task, receive the performance, and we're gonna store that into like a type of memory, like the agent's memory. And then after we do that, every so often, we're going to basically go through our memory, select some networks, um, and then like update the Q values of the, like from those networks, or sorry, update the Q values of the trajectories that those networks like basically manifested as. Um, and kind of give the agent the reward of the, as the accuracy that, it, that network achieved on the problem. And so basically it's just sample networks, train them, and then update Q values based on the performance those networks achieved. And this is the algorithm. So this is the kind of, uh, I guess if you followed to here, this, that's the, that, that was the trickiest part. This kind of factor uh, incremented or computed in any way or requires manual or calibration? Um, <coughs> so there are some things that you will have to calibrate, such as the like the exploration schedule. Um, and I think we're going to get into that. Yeah, I'm right here. Uh, and so, for so we've saw we see we've seen like how to actually update the Q values. But how do we actually go about like exploring, right? Like as we saw when we only updated based on one key, on one network, the Q values weren't very interesting. It didn't really learn anything other than just to reselect that network again. Um, and so what we actually do, which is quite common in like the game playing literature, is we use this like epsilon greedy exploration strategy. And so what we do is we anneal epsilon from one to zero. And so as you can see here, if you have a high epsilon, that means you have a high chance of randomly selecting an action, right? And then you have a one minus epsilon chance of choosing like the greedy action based on your current estimate of the Q values. And so what you do is you start at a high epsilon, so a very random policy, it'll be randomly taking actions, and then you slowly anneal epsilon to be like 0 0.1 or you know, pretty low, so that it will be choosing uh, mostly greedy actions, and therefore like networks that should be better than, than where you're just choosing random actions. And so yeah, choosing this schedule is I guess in some cases uh, tricky. We just found that the first one we used worked, um, and the second one we used also worked, so you know, <laughs> we didn't really find it to be that tricky for this problem. Um, um, but yeah, there, uh, I guess you'd also have to tune your alpha, your learning rate of the Q-learning uh, uh, agent, and also, of course, like how you actually train each neural network on the task. You know, we're not, we didn't talk about, you know, do I use the atom optimizer or just standard SGD or anything like that. Um, uh, so the agent has no knowledge of that entire process, and that's something that we manually just kind of created a, a set of hyperparameters for. Would it make sense to create an array, just to read the array of the reference, and test it out against the combined? We're already dealing with massive computation. Yeah, so um, for our um, purposes, we didn't actually have uh, as much computation as we would need to do that further optimization. Um, so we kept it to only searching through the architectures with a fixed set of like optimization <coughs> hyperparameters, um, which we found to be like, that worked pretty well for most architectures in the search space. Um, but yeah, if you had more computation, it would definitely be beneficial to actually search through the optimization hyperparameters as well and not keep those fixed. Um, but we're just a small lab, so, <laughs> yeah. So what is the dimension of your state space and how can we guarantee you to reach the terminal state? So every state has the option, so at the agent at every state has the option to terminate and terminate the network at that point, which is how you can get variable size networks. Um, and the size of the state space in our experiment was, I think, like on the order of like 10,000 states or so. Um, I'll show you the, the state space table in a second. Okay. Yeah. I'm still not really clear on how the reward, the reward is actually calculated. Do you, so you pick that first convolutional layer and then cap it off with a softmax function on a bunch of images to really calculate the reward. Do you, do you compute gradients every time you do retrain the algorithm every time you pick a new layer and then um, calculate the reward based on that? 
So the reward is only given to the agent at the very end of the network, right? So we're not going to say, uh, you know, if, the, if I chose a four-layer network, I'm not going to evaluate that network as a two-layer network, three-layer network, and four-layer network. I'm just going to take that network, train it, um, and then give the reward to the agent in like that final state. And then that final, like, like basically through Q learning, that reward will essentially propagate back through the other states. And so we're only training the network once, um, and we do that with you know SGD on like you know uh, the, the the classification data set we're looking at, um, and then you take like the validation performance, the validation accuracy as the reward for the for the agent. So you sample the entire network. Yes. Yeah. So you sample the entire network, train it, update the Q values with the accuracy that you achieved. And so yeah, I guess uh, so. Like if we go back here, right? Uh, as we as we saw, we started with the reward here at the very end, the goal state, yeah. and we didn't give it a reward anywhere else in the state state, in like in this trajectory. We just updated the Q values at earlier parts in the network with this like the max over future Q over like next Q value, right? Yeah, and so that's how it propagated back. So is this search space a tree or a graph? So how many parents would uh, it's a DAG. It's a directed acyclic graph. Is it a yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um so is there any idea of optimizing the architecture of each layer? And I'm also thinking that if you did that, you might incorporate something that would like boosting into that process. Like what? Like boosting. Boosting. Yeah. Um so the architect I mean like I guess each layer is just a function, so it's like a convolutional function or like a pooling kind of like downsampling function. Um, you could definitely optimize that function as part of this process. Your kind of like state space would just like enormously blow up, and so the reason we made like a bunch of kind of like constraining choices was so that you could actually like learn something. That the agent could learn something in the end. Um, though you're right in that uh, you could optimize like you know. Uh, you could optimize a new activation function. You could optimize a new way of connecting neurons one by one. But by using, like, kind of like making these uh, simplifying assumptions, we're actually able to learn and you know perform pretty well on the, the target task in the end. Is the reason. Is there any concept of doing something like a bean search where you carry along a number of competing networks and each one? optimize along its own trajectory? Um, we run it all in parallel um, already. So Q learning is in, it's called an off policy algorithm. So you can really easily just make the whole thing parallel. You can train as many networks as you have VPUs already. Yeah. Well the beam search would, would be parallel from a given optimum state and then each one of them would, would move off in a slightly different um, yeah, we haven't considered that, but that is not that you could do that. So, so that's quite weird. That's, so every every uh, sample the network is just purely random. There's no directed search or learning from the previous results to try to look forward. So that's what. Um, so we actually basically will start in a phase of like pure exploration. So yes, very, like, completely random actions. And then we slowly anneal the agent to like a phase of exploitation where it is using uh, what it learned more and more. And so we use this policy, the epsilon greedy policy, where we start with epsilon being one, which means I'm like with probability, so with probability epsilon, I take a random action. And with probability one minus epsilon, I take the greedy action. And so when epsilon is one, it's completely random. But then as I slowly move epsilon towards zero, my actions become, with you know, high probability, like with more and more probability, greedy actions, um, and so you are in that when when you use those greedy actions, when epsilon is being annealed, uh, you are using what you learned before, because as this whole process goes on, you are updating your Q values, and so your greedy actions will be based on those estimates that you've been creating. Yeah. I'm not sure if you Cool. So um, I will, yeah, I'm, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, just, I'll just give you the numbers for what it took on our experiments. Um, 
So here's just the state space. Uh, you don't have to really look at all of the numbers. It's just kind of to show you that we basically discretized a lot of the parameters for each layer type. So in that you know, basic example I showed you, it looked like there was one convolutional layer and one pooling layer, and that was it. There's actually like a bunch of different types of convolutional layers, a bunch of different types of pooling layers, um, and so on. And so this is just to show you, like this is in the paper as well, and if you want to look into the details, you can go and find this there. Um, and so yeah, for the experiments we ran, uh, we just ran it on MNIST, CIFAR10, SVHN. They're all pretty similar. Uh, they're all small images, so like around 28 by 28 to 32 by 32. And their data sets are all like kind of roughly around like 60K training images and you know like 10K validation testing images. Um, and so it's all the problem sizes are pretty similar. Um, and so uh, we, uh, for our experiment, we'd, we had about 10 GPUs and you know, mostly kind of like 2015 Titan X's and some newer ones. Um, and it took roughly like 10 days for each one of those experiments. Um, so roughly 100 GPU days for, for those. Though that was with like kind of like our initial epsilon schedule. So like how many you know, networks I sample at high epsilon and at low epsilon in the epsilon greedy uh, uh, policy. Um, and so we actually found after that that you could reduce that search uh, schedule a lot and it would still be fine. Um, yeah, I saw you kind of balk at kind of how much <laughs> how much computation pie it is. So, oh, yeah. So, yeah, from my understanding, this is just for choosing the architecture of the new network. Actually, there's some, many, some other factors affecting the performance of the new network. For example, there are some other hyperparameters like running rate, uh, decay rate, moment, all those kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so for yeah, so we basically kept those <coughs> parameters fixed, and we tried to use like an op so we use the atom optimizer, which will kind of like automatically uh, change your learning rate based on like the variance of the gradients. Um, and so we just kind of found that that was able to optimize pretty much most of the things in our search space to to uh, this like a pretty good degree. Um, but you're right in that if you really wanted to do like a full really good experiment, you would want to jointly optimize those training like hyperparameters. And I'll just tell you that on this amount of like computational power, it's gonna be pretty hard. Um, on you know like I there are some papers from Google where they do do that and they you know they'll use like many hundreds of GPUs in like <laughs> a long time. I'll, I'll actually show you some of those results in a sec. Um, but um, yeah so the actual so this is kind of like we want to, I've told you how it works, uh, or how the, actually the algorithm works, but here is uh, the results on CIFAR 10, one of those experiments. And so we talked about the epsilon schedule, right? And so epsilon being one, remember, is the completely random policy, right? And then as you go more and more towards zero, it becomes more and more greedy. And so as we can see here, each one of these blocks is like another block of decreasing epsilon, so one to 0 0.1. Um, and as you can see, as you tune epsilon down, the, perf the average performance you get actually goes up. So as the agent is becoming more and more greedy, it's it, based on what it's learned, uh, it's, it's like average network it chooses, the performance of it goes way, way up. As you can see, it goes up by like 20% over the course of you know, uh, a couple of thousand models. And so we see that in the other two experiments. Uh, on SVHN it learns a lot, on MNIST it doesn't learn that much just because most things work on MNIST, so it's <laughs> hard to improve. Yeah? The, the entirely greedy phase doesn't seem to be doing anything useful, right? Because it doesn't seem to be actually improving until you actually started. Oh, sorry, the, the non-greedy phase, it's totally random phase, right? So, Was that expected? Um, yeah, so basic, so I mean, so remember the first example we had where we sampled the one architecture and then we updated the Q values, right? You need enough like samples to actually have learned uh, the u useful Q values, right? Because in that case, when you sample that one architecture, it did you know 90%. If I suddenly turn on the greedy like epsilon, right, it will just rechoose that network, and we haven't really learned anything. We haven't it, we haven't improved anything. So you'll see this across all epsilon greedy, probably. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I said, we just kind of had a, you know, like one 
uh, a schedule and it worked and then we had like another schedule and that also worked so we were kind of just like yeah it's mostly going to work most of the time so <laughs> yeah just to get some intuition what what do these networks kind of look like and were you surprised by any of the results of the shape of it? yeah um so the networks i will say i don't know if i have them in this this presentation but they're in the paper and basically the the main point is that they don't look like things a human would design so a human likes lots of patterns it likes to like every architecture human architecture designer likes a lot of to repeat the same thing over and over again if you've seen resnet it's the same thing over and over again for a thousand layers right like who's to say that's the best architecture we just do it because it's easy right inception is the same thing you, they designed an inception module and they kind of placed it in a bunch of places in a pattern right so these things don't really have any of those patterns it's i at least that i could see just with my eye um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of what I'll say. But the, the, the architectures are online um, on the paper. Yeah. Yeah. You were targeting smaller models that could run on an uh, performance embedded device. Did you get small models out of it? So we haven't run that experiment, but you could very easily incorporate into your reward like some measure of how fast the model is running, like the, inf the amount of time it takes to do inference. Uh, you could incorporate how much, how many like actual weights the model has. So like, could it actually fit onto a small GPU memory? Um, we haven't done that, but it would base. You could incorporate that into the reward very easily. Yeah. yeah. Does, does that mean that uh, meta meta didn't have a bias towards sort of small networks? Um, so actually, it did, and I will get into that as, in a sec. Actually, um, but. Uh, yeah, the, the bias only came from the optimization hyperparameters, which I'll, yeah, I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, basically, I'll just kind of skip through these really quick. The networks that it produced were pretty comparable. So like in the top plot, ours are at the bottom. Basically, all there is to see here is that of the kind of like the previously published human design networks that were like, those networks were kind of similar to the search space of MetaQNN, uh, we beat all of those. Uh, then if you compare it to things that had kind of more uh, complicated or fancy design patterns such as residual connections, skip connection, uh, uh, sorry, like branching connections, different types of pooling layers, we don't do as well, but we're still competitive for the most part. Um, and uh, here's comparison against a couple others. So if you're interested in this stuff, there's a, actually a lot of work going into it now, um, mostly by Google. <laughs> And uh, so as you can see here, like, uh, these guys actually published at the very same day that we did. So <laughs> that was scary a little bit. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, they do much better on CIFAR 10, but they use you know, 100 times the amount of computation. They used like 800 GPUs for three weeks or something. So you know, go figure. Uh, and that was using a policy gradient algorithm. It's another variant of reinforcement learning. Uh, this one here, also out of Google, it's a like an, an evolution type algorithm, um, and basically it kind of like trains a bunch of models, compares them, and then mutates the good ones um, with like single mutations. Uh, yeah. And so yeah, so here's the kind of uh, like that you asked about that bias, um, and so different model depths don't train equally. So if you ever try to train like a thousand layer ResNet and a 10 layer ResNet, the 10 layer ResNet trains really quickly, but in the end won't be as good. And the thousand layer ResNet trains really slowly. Um, and so that's what we see here where, you know, these are, I didn't give you the architecture, but we had a, a model that was, had nine layers and a model that had 15 layers. The nine layer model we thought to be the best because we're training all of these models to 20 epochs on a fixed optimization schedule. Um, and then we say, okay, I'm just going to take you know, the best model I found with that 20 epoch validation accuracy, and then I'll finally train that out to like 300 epochs. And so you know, as you can see, the 20 epoch accuracy, the nine layer model is much, much better, right? Uh, three per over 3%. But then if you actually train it out to 300, it's actually worse than this 15 layer model. Um, and this 15 layer model was the best 15 layer model that MetaQNN chose over its exploration phase. Um, and so I guess if we had had, this is like, these are kind of like updated results. And so if you, if we had had, uh, if we had done this analysis, then, you know, we could have maybe like incorporated some method to, you know, look at different depths of models or like, you know, different sizes of models, uh, because this bias was like basically, 
made it so that we couldn't actually find the best model in our space. Um, but it's promising because, you know, we actually did get 94.7%, which if we go back to the, uh, these, uh, this plot or this table with all of the uh, results of kind of like more like fancier models, um, we actually beat everything except, you know, a thousand layer ResNet. And these are just with like very simple convolutions, simple pooling layers, nothing fancy, like kind of 2014 deep learning basically. Um, so that's kind of uh, promising to see. Um, and then here as well, uh, just with the updated number, you know, we get like 5.3 in 100 GPU days, which, you know, beats out, you know, the evolutionary algorithm, which, you know, takes 2,600 GPU days, gets closer to the architecture search, but, you know, still no cake. Cool. And so, um, yeah, now that we've kind of gone through the results, I just wanted to give you like a little bit of intuition about the, the architecture space and why something like this is even possible, maybe. Um, and so here is like a very simple diagram of like what a neural network could be. So the C's mean convolution, D means dropout, P means pooling, and SM means softmax. So this is like a pretty, you know, short neural network. And then I want to define edit distance as being like uh, the kind of the standard edit distance for strings. So for instance, if I switch one layer, that would be like an edit distance of one. If I remove a layer, it's an edit distance of one. There's no like Convolutional layers aren't closer to other convolutional layers. It's just, if you change it, it's, it's at a distance of one. And so, you can basically use this distance to do a 2D embedding using like TSNE or whatever your favorite thing it, uh, package is. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of interesting, but when you color this plot by the accuracy all of these models achieve, so here, every point is an architecture. And it's basically, this is just trying to map like we've given, we've basically computed a distance between each architecture using the edit distance. And now it's basically like embedding that in 2D space, trying to keep those distances, have those distances be preserved. So it knows nothing about the accuracy that each architecture, architecture achieved, only the architecture. When you color it based on accuracy, you actually find some like, you know, there, there are some scattered black dots, but there are some like pretty significant groups of like very poor performance and very good performance. As you can see there, you know, you have like this area that like, basically you made one edit probably to get into this very, very bad region of models. And you could also make that, like reverse that edit to get into a very good region of models. Um, and so this kind of, for me, gives me some intuition on, you know, uh, why can these like simple choices, these simple assumptions we made in this Q learning experiment, why can they actually um, uh, perform well in the end? Because there are some very uh, uh, like, you know, bad choices you can make. And then like every, every model in that space is going to be bad. Um, and you can see the same. That was on SVHN. You can see the same thing in C410. Um, and again, I missed you know, all the models are pretty much the same. So <laughs> not worth showing. Um, cool. So that was, I don't know. Good. Good time. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, that was um, the uh, like the first part, um, and that was kind of like how we basically use reinforcement learning to generate architectures iteratively and like get better and better. Um, so if there's any questions on that, now I can answer some more now, or I can jump into the next bit on like a simple way to speed up that entire process. Cool. Okay, so, so basically it's just the most, uh, you know, amazing thing about it is about this, that you could add rewards, based, but probably you last uh, along this uh, path between layers. So basically the reward means um, uh, in a certain state, right, an average reward uh, based, your average upon all possible paths below it and above it, and it just kind of works because you showed it on the video of the slide, is it existence. Yeah. So this interesting thing. Yeah, I think so too. Cool. Um, so I'll just briefly go over the next part because we're don't have that much more time. But here's that plot on results again, and you know, bolded is the amount of computation used, and it's just like crazy. So like you thought, you know, our hundred GPU days was like a lot, right? Well. You know, to get like even better results, you need like 10,000 GPU days, or even you know somewhere in that in that range. 
Um, and so uh, our idea for speeding it up was basically that like, humans are pretty good at you know, stopping suboptimal configurations. So if here are like two curves of validation accuracy between two different models, and you, the human architecture designer, the machine learning engineer, are training them both on your two GPUs, and you see you know, the blue one is just doing like much worse. You could probably stop the blue one here, and you could be pretty certain that it's never going to be better than this red one. And you like, and you have no certainty on it, but you're pretty sure. And it's like a pretty, you know, it's probably a pretty good idea to, to terminate it early. Um, and so uh, we basically like to do this. We started out by saying, can we actually predict how well a neural network would, will do before we finish training it? And so here are a bunch of full curves. You know, they've all been trained to the, the, the max amount you want to. Um, and then here's the prediction problem where I say, okay, now I only have, say, like 25% of the learning curve observed. I want to predict the final accuracy these networks would have gotten just from the learning curve. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, and so then I want to use that prediction to actually do early stopping. So if I have a prediction that, say, my, my, out, my performance predictor said, this architecture is going to do you know, 20% worse than my current best, I can just stop that architecture at that point and start training a new one, right? Which would basically allow me to speed up the entire process quite a lot. And so here's just like a teaser plot where basically we've done that. So here are like all of the architectures from that meta and experiment. Um, and then here um, basically is what we have after we implement an early stopping algorithm. As you can see, pretty much like all of these models that are like, you know, uh, converging to very poor performance are getting cut out really early on. And you're able to, and then this I think is around like a 5x overall speed up. So like it would only be 20 GPU days for, for that meta QNN experiment. Um, yeah, and so I'll just, uh, so that's kind of a teaser, and, which is pretty cool. And these things work really well, and I'll, I'll get into that in a sec. But here's just the kind of like the outline of the, the performance prediction model, where it's like you have your partially observed learning curves, right? You have some maybe model features, such as, you know, you could include the number of layers in the architecture, the number of weights it had, really whatever you want. It turns out the partially observed learning curves are the most predictive feature of like final performance. Um, and these kind of like the, the model features, like number of layers, or you know, they, they, they definitely help, but not that much. Um, and at the bottom, we just say like it works for both. Like we actually on this experiment, in the first thing I showed you with MetaQNN, we were only changing the architecture of the models and keeping the hyperparameter optimization, like the op like the learning rate, uh, the weight decay, those things fixed. Uh, we actually show that it works fine when you're doing this with like a hyperparameter optimization. A problem as well, where you try to find the best set of uh, learning hyperparameters for a given architecture. Um, right, and so here's this plot again of the uh, uh, the partially observed learning curves, and then you know here's how well you can actually do. This is a, a plot of on the bottom you have the true performance, and on the or sorry the bottom axis you have the true performance, and on the y axis you have the predicted performance. And so you can actually get an R square of you know 97. Um, with just 25% of the learning curve, which is really good. Which means, like, basically, like, for most, in most cases, I don't actually need to train these models all the way to the end. I can just stop them early when I know they're worse than what I've currently seen, when I, than what I've seen before. Which is really cool. Um, and so, now that we have that performance prediction model, though, I want to be able to use that in a way that is like a little bit smarter than just saying like. My current best model is at 80%. I predicted this model that's training right now will be 79%. Let's cut it. Right? Well, what if that model was predicted to be 79.9999%? Right? It's really close to 80. It might actually, in the end, kind of jump above it. Um, so we want to basically create an estimate of uncertainty um, of like, that prediction. And uh, the way we do that is so like, given our performance prediction model, which you know, could be like SVR, um, you know, like ordinary least squares, choose your favorite kind of frequentist algorithm. Uh, then we can like, what we did is we just assume the error, the errors in the predictions of the performance are like mean zero Gaussians, um, and we estimate like this kind of like how 
how wide those error gaussians are just using like leave one out cross validation. So if I have a training set of like a hundred models that I've trained to, you know, the the final uh, uh, epoch. So in MetaQNN, that final epoch was 20, right? So I have a hundred models I've trained to 20 epochs. Now I'm going to train a bunch of, you know, say SVRs um, to predict the 20th epoch accuracy from my five epoch accuracy, fifth epoch accuracy. And then I'll estimate uh, the basically the variance of the error using leave one out cross validation. Which is a really simple assumption. It's not that great of one. Like I wouldn't, you know, copy it into many fields, but it turns out just like works really well in this in this situation. Uh, and then we can define using this kind of assumption of uh, zero mean Gaussian error, we can basically just define a probability of improvement, um, which says, you know, what's the probability that this estimate I have, so this predicted y of like the final t, uh, is better uh, than my current. Well, or sorry, I guess this is the probability of not improving. <laughs> um, but it's like the probability that's worse than my, my current best. And that's just, you know, 1 minus the, the CDF of the Gaussian, which is uh, simple to compute. Um, and then finally, I can just like define an acceptance probability threshold, like delta, such that I say, I, you know, if my probability that my predicted value my, of this network that's currently training is less than my current best, if that probability is, you know, greater than some threshold, then I'll just cut off the model, I'm done. I know it's probably not going to actually perform better than my current best. So this is really the very simple algorithm. Um, and uh, yeah, it, in, in the end, it uh, will basically get you really, really drastic speedups. And so here, um, we show the simulated speedup over MetaQNN um, with the, like, versus the probability threshold we set. And so as you can see, when you have you know, like a low probability threshold, um, oh, I guess there's more notation. <laughs> um, so like the x's mean that you know, on average, we don't recover the best model. The triangles mean, on average, we do. So in, that, in those cases, in the triangle cases, uh, when we implemented this early stopping algorithm, there was actually no hit to overall performance. It was just faster, basically. Um, and uh, I guess just for now, ignore delta and top 10. But <laughs> uh, bottom line, basically, is that you know, for, on the CIFAR 10 experiment, you could, say, set your probability threshold to 85, and you could get like around uh, a 6x speed up over the original MetaQ and then. Um, Um, so like these, like the regression models we used don't make any assumption like that. Um, so there are some works that are similar to this where they say do Bayesian regression with a set of basis functions that like kind of look like learning curves. And so it will kind of interpolate, you know, kind of super sharp learning curves and kind of, you know, more uh, graduated learning curves. Um, but in our experiment, we make no assumptions like that. Just based, so like the, the, the actual procedure would be, I run MetaQNN for 100 random samples in the start, right? Which is what we do anyway, with epsilon being one. I get these 100 models that have all trained at 20 epochs. Then I train my performance predictors using that training set. And then from that point on, I can early stop any models uh, that might, might be uh, like believed to be performing uh, worse. So we basically assume, yes, that uh, the future models will have learning curves somewhat similar to the curves that we've found in those initial uh, 100 models. Um, in these problems, that um, there was no issue with that. But maybe in, like I guess, harder domains where you might have like only a few architectures that perform well, which in my experience, experience doesn't really happen. You know, you won't really have like a, a only a few architectures that work. There'll be a bunch of them that are kind of okay or pretty close. Um, so yeah, but in those situations, it wouldn't work at risk. So that leads to the, the next question is that how you um, choose uh, 
the initial uh, contact measures, uh, so that they are um, they are represented at the entire we just did random, um, so uh, a random sampling, and uh, in all of our results, which are in the uh, which are in the paper, like more analysis, uh, we basically we show numbers for like you know uh, different random initial samplings, and it pretty much always works out. And that, these are actually uh, all over ten different uh, experiments. So the triangle basically means like over those ten experiments on average, did we recover the best model found, uh, that, that the MetaQNN found. Um, and so um, uh, these are all already kind of indicative that, or like this kind of uh, number of experiments we did is already kind of indicative that a random, like any random sampling is pretty okay for, um, for to, to change these. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you thought about doing something like a um, how do you say the edit distance, or say the architectures that are effectively the same architecture but have some different parameters in each connectivity and in each layer? You thought about um, modifying the threshold for stopping for an architecture that's close to an architecture that's doing well, but is not doing quite as well. Oh, I do like a nearest neighbor kind of thing? Yes. Um, yeah, we haven't thought about it, um, but yeah, you could totally try to implement that. I think you maybe would need a larger initial like sampling of models so that you have something that you know every model is close to. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something you could experiment around with. Yeah. There's a high level thing I think I'm missing here. Um, which is like the actual context of the early stopping problem. Is the thing you're stopping early a step where you're computing the reward? Given yeah. Batch, or is it the sort of overarching exploit problem? Yeah. So yeah, there's. I guess there's two learning steps that happen in the in the MetaQNN thing, right? The first, like the higher level one, is the Q learning uh, algorithm, which will take the reward of trained architectures and kind of you know update key values. And then the lower level one is how we actually train each architecture on the problem. And so that's where we're doing early stopping, where you know over the course of MetaQNN. We actually trained like 2,700 unique models, right? And so what this actually does is it says, okay, those first 100 I'll train to the 20 epochs, but then the remaining 2,600 I'm going to stop actually a lot of them from completing the full 20 epochs because I know um, that they won't do well. And that's why we actually implemented it with the performance prediction aspect because for reinforcement learning you need to give a reward to the agent, right? You can't. I mean you. It won't learn anything if you don't give it a reward, basically. And so we actually use the predicted accuracy as the reward um, for those like architectures that we have terminated early. And that's why we do the performance prediction as well. Yeah? Um, did the stopping, or early stopping kind of optimization make the bias towards shorter models worse? Or um, so it didn't make them, I don't think it would make it worse, but I think like, so for instance, when, when I sorted through all of our models and found the best model that had like the best 15 layer model that uh, based on the 20 epoch accuracy, you probably wouldn't have actually finished training that model because you would have early stopped it. Um, so I think like if you were to, you would have to basically have in mind that bias already when you're making your experiment. I think what you could do with this is for instance you could Instead of training to 20 epochs, train to 100 epochs. Use your 5x speed up to have the same overall computation time in the end. But now that you're training to 100 epochs, you might um, hope that basically this problem of intersecting learning curves uh, will go away. Like basically, most of them at that point have like already intersected and you know are kind of ordered proper properly. Uh, that's that's kind of the easiest way you could maybe uh, get rid of that bias, but I'll still use early stop. Yeah. Um, so oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, this is the summary. Just my info. Uh, this the slides will be um, on my website later, and here are the uh, papers. Thanks.